you guys ready for me to pull up the PowerPoint or? Sure, Great. we're gonna go ahead and we'll get started today. Um, and today's topic is gonna be uh, writing a review paper. Okay, so um, this is a, a bit of a longer session uh, like last week's was when we talked about qualitative research. So uh, bear with us and uh, we'll get through this and then um, have a discussion at the, at the end. So um, Jessica, we can go to the next slide. So a review article provides a comprehensive and systematic summary of results from available um, uh, research that has been done in a given field. Um, and the purpose is to see the topic under consideration from a new perspective. Um, the paper will draw upon recent studies by other researchers. And the key here is that we then want to make a critical analysis, um, summarize the praise and classify that data to offer a new synthesis of the latest research in a specific uh, subject area, ultimately arriving at new um, cumulative, cumulative um, conclusions. Next slide. So there are a couple potential goals for such review papers. Um, it could be the development of a theory, the evaluation of a theory, um, a survey of the state of knowledge on a specific topic, which generally when doctoral students talk to me, they say that this is what they want to do, um, get a, a broad layout of um, a specific topic. Um, it can also be used for problem identification and also to provide a historical count of the development of a theory um, on a particular topic. Next slide. Um, review articles are also useful in science and everyday life in terms of making policy. Um, and in particular with addiction science, um, they have become necessary by providing a systematic summary of existing evidence while coming up with new ideas and pointing out the unique contributions of the work. Um, however, um, you know, when you're thinking about a, a huge synthesis like this and then coming up with unique contributions, this can be a difficult challenge um, for inexperienced either clinicians or researchers. So, um, you know, writing a review paper is not an easy task, um, but it certainly is worthwhile. Next slide. <clears throat> um, just like with everything else, um, different journals are gonna have different criteria for reviews. So um, in the first uh, journal here, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but addictology. Um, they define a review paper as a clear and logical summary of topical issues. Um, and the key here is that the author's own experience is not the underlying theme of the paper. You're gathering the results of other authors' uh, research. Um, for this particular uh, um, journal, the uh, maximum length of a, of a paper is 16 pages with no more than 50 citations and generally literature not more than uh, five or so years old. Um, in addiction, uh, reviews simply draw together on a body of literature that reach one or more uh, main conclusions, up to 4,000 words and no limit on citations. So just like when you're thinking about preparing any, off, any paper for publication, you really want to check with the journal guidelines. Um, so that you already have them in the back of your mind as you're trying to pull all of this information together. Next slide, please. So um, typically when you, you know, think of kind of traditional types of review papers, um, these were called narrative uh, literature reviews. And um, these would assess the quality and results of a selection of literature using implicit criteria. And the results were often um, based on subjective interpretations and um, which 
often cause biases in unsystematic ways. And essentially a narrative review is a one-time paper. It's not replicable, which is, shows a little bit of a difference between a narrative review and systematic reviews. So systematic reviews use explicit literature research strategies, inclusion and exclusion criteria for determining the quality and reliability of the study findings. Those, these are spelled out so that everybody is able to see them and knows the thinking of the authors behind uh, selection of the articles. Systematic reviews are replicable and the conclusions drawn by the authors are more easily verifiable. So um, one of the um, key points on thinking about doing systematic reviews is keeping extensive notes um, on the papers that have been reviewed and why they were or were not included so that um, these results can be uh, verified and replicated. Um, systematic reviews uh, do not include um, an evaluation, systematic reviews that do not include um, an evaluation of studying of study findings is referred to as a hybrid narrative review. Next slide. So hybrid narrative reviews provide authors with a greater freedom to interpret and integrate uh, study results and conclusions compared to systematic reviews, but still allow the reader to determine the authenticity of the author's findings. So there still is an explicit um, uh, procedure that was followed that others would be able to follow as well. Um, they're particularly important for theory development and problem identification, um, especially when peer-reviewed literature is incomplete and when important studies may not use rigorous experimental or longitudinal designs. So it really allows us to include a wide variety of uh, papers in the review. Next slide. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the first step when you're thinking about doing any time of systematic review is that you wanna think about what journal you want to go to. Um, I would definitely recommend asking the editor if this is something that they may be interested in um, because systematic reviews tend to be longer manuscripts and they may, if it's a print journal, take up a number of pages. And so we may want to um, include some supplemental digital content uh, for appendices and tables, et cetera. Um, so you wanna ask the editor whether this is something that they're interested in. And then if you get a positive response, again, it is most important to follow the author guidelines. And I highlight that not only here, but um, for um, every paper that you write. So when we think about starting a systematic review, we want to state the aims of the review clearly, um, just like you would in a qualitative research paper or a quantitative research paper. Um, the aims are going to determine the choice of the specific procedures used uh, to search uh, your literature searches and the processes um, that you use to present the results. Um, in the concluding section of the study, it should be stated whether um, and to what extent the extents have, uh, the aims have been fulfilled. So just like with um, typical uh, research studies, the aim usually appears at the end of the introduction. And then in the conclusion, you wanna make a comment on uh, whether or not the aims have been um, achieved. An example of an aim may be um, as follows. To provide a systematic review of the results of studies published between 2000 and 2015 that investigate the relationship between the level of parental control and alcohol use among children and adolescents. So it's very clear, you have an idea of what the variables all the, are that you're going to be looking at and a clue as to what kind of articles you may see. Next slide. 
Um, again, in a review paper, the research question is included and expressed in the text, um, and it's formulated as the research problem, which it becomes the topic and the focus of the work. It must correspond with the objectives of the study and be aligned with the methodologies. Um, so for an article investigating the quality and type of emotional bonds in young adults who use cannabis, the research question might be, can insecure emotional bonds be associated with a higher rate of cannabis use among young adults? So again, um, you know, the, the aims and the research questions really are going to kind of guide the um, procedures and methods that you're going to use in your review. Next slide. <clears throat> Next in the process is to identify your data sources. Um, and the primary and most important sources for data are electronic da databases, of course, um, often accessed through university libraries. Um, and just as an aside, how many papers you can access will depend upon the levels of access granted by the university to students and members of the staff. And um, oftentimes what we see is you may have access through many databases, but to the full text, um, it may be limited, leaving only the abstract, which may not be sufficient enough for you to decide whether or not you're going to include that in your review. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, uh, data sources, um, the following databases are recommended and there are uh, names here and links. And uh, this really provides a nice overview of um, lots of uh, references uh, within the field. Okay, next slide. So, um, the important thing is that as well as any formal databases and full text study, it is possible to include uh, conference presentations, especially if they have been uh, published and have gone through a peer review process. But you may also include monographs, articles in peer reviewed but non indexed journals, handbooks and manuals relating to the topic. You may even include information from theses and dissertations. Um, and if so, these can be included in um, the PRISMA category, records identif identified through other sources. And you'll see that in the flow diagram in just a few slides. This is sometimes, um, yeah, okay. Um, next slide, please. So um, determining the selection criteria, we have a number of um, key concepts that you wanna keep in the back of your mind and we'll go over these next. So first of all, the year of publication, that is designating the period that is under study um, uh, and is often listed um, in the aims. And so in the example given, it was articles from 2000 to 2015. Um, the number of citations of the article, this can be found in the databases, usually under the heading time cited. And of course, um, articles with a greater number of citations uh, report on more prestigious research. Um, again, keywords is the terminology in a given field and can help to identify the most relevant studies. Next slide. And in terms of relevance of the articles, uh, databases may turn up a number of articles, but because of the potential overlap of keywords and other parameters, some works may be inconsistent with the focus of the review. So really it becomes necessary to read through all articles um, or abstracts to either include or exclude uh, relevant or irrelevant work. Um, the type of publication, um, although you may want to work with original and review studies only, specific topics may require information from annual reports, research reports, or guidelines. 
And um, if you're including these other materials, you want to be sure to state these factors in a description of the procedure that you're using. Next. Um, in terms of uh, study design, research studies may be further divided into subcategories. Uh, for example, reviews versus original work or with clinical issues or with cross-sectional versus longitudinal designs. And the language of the publication, um, typically languages that predominate in science are either English and Spanish. Um, however, Chinese is emerging as a new uh, language of science. And the Web of Science databases now provide the option of searching studies in Chinese. Next which leads into the next variable, which is sociodemographic environments. And it's, use, it's useful to uh, describe the environments in which the study was conducted as it may um, influence the review results. Um, the review needs to take into account when presenting the research results, what that sociodemographic environment was. And then again, uh, funding sources and conflicts of interest uh, the funding source of the study and other conflicts of interest may influence how the results have been interpreted. And, you know, we know that there may be biases um, that have been uncovered when the funding source or the authors have a financial stake in the results of the study, not surprisingly. Okay, so um, the next slide. So the complete um, literature search process needs to be recorded and documented. And the most common system used is the uh, PRISMA study flow diagram. And this stands for the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And if you see on this um, diagram, a couple of the um, topics that have been indicated are the records that have been identified through database search, uh, searching, additional rec uh, records that have been identified through other sources that we talked about earlier, and then um, the records screened, um, then records excluded over to the, when you're looking at this uh, chart to the right, and then, um, Finally, the full text articles assessed for eligibility, and then full text articles ex excluded with the reasons for those um, ex exclusions, and then studies in the qualitative evaluation or quantitative evaluation. So, um, you know, it, this takes a number of steps. And again, the, this is the area where you wanna make sure that you're keeping um, your notes on um, your inclusion and exclusion criteria and the reasoning behind why you included or excluded something. Um, so new and hot off the press is an updated PRISMA guideline, which was completed in 2020. And um, in the PRISMA 2020 um, update, there is a 27 item checklist an expanded checklist that details reporting recommendations for each item. There is also a PRISMA 2020 abstract um, checklist and the revised flow diagrams for original and updated reviews are also available. And it um, also includes new reporting guidelines that reflect advances in uh, methods to identify, select, appraise and synthesize studies. Um, and so these new guidelines will replace those original pre, uh, PRISMA guidelines from the uh, 2009. And if you're interested, I can go ahead and send Jessica a copy of those new updated guidelines and um, she can send them out to everyone. Next slide. So as well as the PRISMA diagram, Results should further be summarized in a structured form like a table according to the classification criteria. It is advisable again to compare the qualitative and quantitative perspectives of the study. 
And again, some of these tables may be extremely long. I know that we um, are just going to get ready to publish something in uh, the Journal of Addiction Nursing. And I think the manuscript was about um, 18 pages and there was a 10 page uh, table. And so we asked the author to move the table into the supplemental digital content. Um, when using the quantitative perspective, follow the number of studies um, that use the longitudinal versus cross-sectional design. How many use standardized methods versus one developed for that particular study? And then how many studies balanced participants in terms of being representative and how many did not? Um, and then the nice thing about qualitative studies, it makes it possible to look for even broader aspects of the work as well as their, final, their finer subtleties in the results that have been ascertained. And when we talked about qualitative research last week, we talked about you know, that it gives us the possibility to find some of that very rich um, uh, uh, data that um, supports uh, perhaps quantitative um, information. And the same thing can be said uh, for a review article as well provides a, a nice uh, background. Next. So the interpretation of results should always be based on the results and findings specified in a given study. Um, we want to make sure that as the author, we are refraining from adding any new conclusions of our own because the principal idea here is to preserve and express the original author's idea as precisely as possible. Um, so when formulating the ideas and working with other review studies, you should always look up the primary source and interpret its results. Other review studies may serve as an inspiration in classifying your results rather than being a source of their own. So functioning kind of as a background. So really the important point here is that with systematic reviews, you really wanna go back to that primary source um, and um, report on the results of that. Because um, you know, just like with writing a, a, a research paper, you don't want to use another author's interpretation of those results. You wanna use your, the author's um, interpretation of the results. Next slide. Um, of course, any copyright uh, rules should be observed when making citations. Um, and you should seek to be as accurate as possible and restate the author's original argument, looking up other relevant works on the topic that you will cite in the same way. And it's necessary to be sensitive when interpreting the results from different sociocultural settings, as we mentioned before. Um, so we want to make sure that um, we're not making unreasonable generalizations and um, that the interpretations are in terms of any given social context. Okay, next slide. Uh, once the results have been processed and interpreted, you need to think about the results and compare them um, with conclusions drawn by other relevant studies. Again, comparing um, what has been done before. This requires that you bring a new perspective to the subject under study, uh, singling out and discussing the most salient findings from the results of your review. And importantly, the discussion should compare and evaluate the results against other relevant research projects, rather than against the presentation of the author's opinions on this issue. So just like we talked about um, in quote, regular research uh, presentations, you're going back to um, the literature to comment on, you know, how your project supported or didn't support that, uh, the previous literature. And again, it's the same thing, you know, how does this review compare to previous reviews that have been done? Next. So each idea or result presented in the article needs to be properly cited. The conclusion consists of a practical evaluation of the study 
and it should, again, not um, contain any new findings or evidence. Its purpose is to, be, to briefly summarize the results and contribution of the study as a whole, and is important to practice communicating uh, the author's own views concisely. Next. Um, so with review articles, the conclusion um, often includes recommendations <coughs> for further research and perhaps tips for practice. Um, and um, in the conclusion section, again, it's nice to be able to highlight the unique contrib contributions of your review. Um, again, uh, we want to make sure that you're following instructions for authors where you intend to submit your uh, paper. Uh, some journals prefer the discussion and conclusion uh, sections to be different. Others uh, say that you can, you can combine them. Uh, but more importantly, those, that information for authors will give you a clue as to a word count or a page count, um, which is um, important. Okay, so um, next slide. So just like with um, every type of research, we have a number of potential problems. And uh, one problem is the use of different terminology used by different authors who publish in the same field. So you really want to kind of think about um, maybe a definition of terms as you're beginning um, your uh, systematic review. Uh, there can also be a wide range of different uh, theoretical backgrounds and there may be um, an, a, a wide range of methodologies. And again, we commented earlier about whether they use standardized methods or was a method developed specifically for that project. Another problem that may be encountered when comparing results between studies is the difference in the number of participants. Um, again, many studies don't have a representative sample um, and there can be great differences in sample sizes, you know, again, which strongly affect the um, ability to generalize findings. Uh, citation bias may significantly, significantly compromise the results. Um, so you want to try to avoid this if you want to arrive at a conclusion that is relevant to the field. And um, if there is citation bias, peer reviewers are generally likely to discover it, especially if they're using a systematic review assessment guide. Next slide. Um, it, this is an important point, um, as within all research, but it's also necessary to consider during the interpretation process, the statistical significance versus clinical significance of studies. In a large number of cases, you will find that the results are not reflected in clinical practice uh, despite being significant. And therefore, it is really important to maintain, maintain contact with clinical practitioners to be able to compare the results with real life. Um, you can then formulate how this uh, significance correlates in the conclusion and what may be necessary to happen to see the results um, end up in clinical practice. So I think um, when we think about evidence-based practice, if you remember the typical time from research findings um, till we see a change in clinical practice typically had been uh, quoted as being 17 years. And when you think about that, even if we cut off 10 of those years and we came up with seven years, it's still a heck of a long time to be seeing the results of you know, great work um, taking that long to get into clinical practice. <clears throat> so uh, the next slide. But specifically for addiction science, uh, the critical evaluation of systematic reviews is extremely important. It is the key to the correct interpretation of select data from particular studies. It can provide background for comparing findings and it can help to identify potentially, potentially disproportionate or dip, different interpretations of findings. 
Um, the tendency to interpret data in a different way and present specific points of view can be a potential source of bias. Uh, for example, um, contrasting study findings in the area of tobacco policy, depending on whether the study was or was not funded by the tobacco industry. So you really have to be explicit um, when um, identifying funding sources for the um, studies that you have reviewed. And um, to end, I would just like to summarize um, systematic reviews by saying a good review article is not possible without a good literature search. And when I talk to my students, I say it's now time uh, to either consult with um, or partner with a academic librarian if there is one available. These uh, guys are brilliant at being able to search out not only those well-published and well-known uh, databases and articles there, but also all of that gray literature um, where you're able to find um, perhaps relevant um, information as well. Um, and just uh, so everyone knows, there are a number of specific approaches uh, to quality assessment of review articles. And these may be very helpful um, if you're sending a review article out for um, review. Um, AMSTAR is one example of a uh, program that was developed to assess systematic reviews. Okay, and I think that may be, Jessica, you wanna see if there's one more, that was it. Okay, so that is systematic reviews in a nutshell. Um, I think they're time consuming um, but they can provide a really great wealth of information. Thank you.